you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory. We thank you.
Hosanna. My God. Hosanna! Yes! Hallelujah! 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 Well, what a wonderful day it is again, a Friday. Uh, Friday, it is the 16th page of chapter 2. Amen? And those of you who have been with us know what I mean. The 16th page of chapter 2. Can you imagine the month of February is is halfway gone my god um, time flies when you're having fun is uh, doesn't it and just want to share a couple of things before I get moving this morning uh, you realize that yesterday our prayer time our the prayer time yesterday was absolutely not planned I uh, the Lord just um, came in and shifted everything yesterday morning The Lord just came in and just shifted everything yesterday morning, and I was just hearing a uh, little feedback in my in my um, in my earphone. Uh, that's why I moved over and switched off something. But uh, it, it was something that God just began an anointing. I just felt I really felt an anointing that is an enablement to just begin to speak uh, words of knowledge and. And as we began to do that, you, did you notice how God just moved right into a prayer mode? So it was word of knowledge, prayer, word of knowledge, prayer, declaration, word of knowledge, prayer, declaration. And uh, there are times when we really have to learn how to flow with God in, in, those, in those ways. Flow with God so that His will and His direction really occurs in whatever we're doing. Amen? Now, we all have, because I had my lesson, I had my plan, I had, you know, where I wanted to go, but, but God uh, said, you know, let's do it this way. And sometimes we study and sometimes we work, you know, work out our own plans. As a matter of fact, a minister um, at uh, one of our teachers in seminary said something to us in class one day. You know, sometimes I, I, I wonder how I remember these things, but only the Holy Ghost. <laughs> but he said something to us in class one day. He said the Lord had, he felt the Lord had um, given him a message to share at, an, at a church that he had been invited to speak, at which he had been, been invited to speak. And when he got there, well, he studied and he studied and he made his notes and he got everything well prepared like he thought he ought to have it prepared. And when he got to church, the Lord shifted the, the message and said, no, I want you to talk about this. And so he said in, in talking with God, and you know, we can talk with God. We, there, the Lord says we are his friend. We are friends of God. We, we have fellowship and we have relationship with him. If we don't understand something, he's not like um, sometimes, unfortunately, you know, um, one of my youngsters uh, I don't know, he's actually not one of my youngsters, I don't know him very well, but I gave him a ride to school one morning. And he was asking, he says, you know, does, he was talking about Michael, um, who lives with me. He says, does Michael, you know, joke with you? Does Michael, you know, run jokes with you? And so on. I said, well, yeah. You know, he comes and he slaps me in the head and he hits me over the shoulder and he does all kinds of crazy things sometimes, you know, typical teenager. And so he laughed and he said, you know, I can't run those kinds of jokes with my parents. And, uh, uh, and uh, we sometimes, because we don't have that f familiarity, we don't have that level of fellowship, we don't have that level of um, camaraderie, you know, with our parents or with our family or with those around us, then we believe that God is so holy, righteous, and distant that we can't talk with him on a friendly basis, that we can't engage him and we can't understand him, nor does he understand us. But he said in the scriptures, we have not an high priest which has not been touched with the feelings of our infirmities, which means he is intimately, intimately familiar with what your thoughts are. He is intimately familiar with your experiences this was a God that did not tell you to come and reach up to him. But this was a God that said, let me reach down to you. 
he came and put on flesh and he decided that he wanted to engage the world. I wonder if, you know, in his own mindset, you know, and I, you know, maybe I'm wrong in thinking for God right now, but I wonder if he said, you know, I want to experience what they experience. I want to be touched with what they are touched with because I live in a realm of glory. I live in a realm of all possibility. I live in a realm that is so different from them, but let me step into their realm. <laughs> Let me step into their world. Have you ever thought of that? That he did not leave us without that kind of testimony that, yes, I've been there. You have said it to yourself, to other people. I've been there. I've done that. And, and God can tell, you know, Satan right now, I've been there. I've done that. And they are my people. I've been there. I've done that. And he can tell you and I. I've been there and I've done that. That's why you are an overcomer. My God, my God, my God, my God. Uh, this is, good morning, good morning everyone again. Uh, this is so amazing that he did not, did not say, come on, like so many other religions, um, come on, you reach up to me. You, you go on a journey to find me. You do all these things you know, uh, to, to locate me. He says, no, I'm going to locate you. I'm going to come into your world. I'm going to enter your realm. I'm going to make you know me because I'm going to come in your path. And that's exactly what he did. And so, you know, like yesterday as I was uh, speaking, you know, about it, that there are times when we really need to, to just sit with God, to just talk with God. You know, I... People look at me, uh, for example, at times, and they're afraid, you know, to come and talk with me. And uh, I have on this um, outfit this morning, my, my attire this morning, my clerical color and all of this. Uh, most of the time I have on a t-shirt or whatever, jeans, walking around the community. And it makes you a lot more approachable. It makes people uh, realize that you are a human too. You are, you're, uh, you're normal. And so you're not always wearing something like this. You're not always, you know, there, there is an appropriateness, you know, for certain types of, um, for, for certain types of clothing. But there are people that will not approach you like that. Some will, but others will be intimidated. And so what do we do? We make ourselves all things to all men, as, as the Apostle Paul says. We open doors of opportunity. So yesterday, God opened the door of opportunity. And uh, so many people, uh, several of you sent me notes. I, I saw the excitement when certain revelation came. And I saw the excitement in the testimonies of either financial, you know, immediate. I, I mean, it seems like almost immediate financial results. Um, immediate healings that occurred yesterday. And I'm sure will continue as different ones will listen to the message. Amen. And, uh, and so, this morning I want to talk about the God. If you notice, the, the hashtags this morning are defended and protected. And I want to go to a familiar psalm, defended and protected. The 91st psalm, and I'm going to look at it in the amplified version of the Bible. Psalm 91. in the Amplified Bible. Psalm 91 in the Amplified Bible. Uh, that's a psalm that, uh, you know, over the years I have I've gone over and I've gone over and I've gone over. And uh, it has so ministered to me and I want to share it with you this morning. Because, you know, we, we, we I, I have taken the time. Now, nobody taught me this, but I was in a little town, Chuckawinity, North Carolina, and uh, many, many, many years, maybe about 25 years ago, if not longer. And uh, I was visiting with some um, fam with a family there, and uh, I was in the living room one night by myself. Uh, the bedroom was around, but I decided to go in the living room, and I was on the carpet in the corner, and uh, I was just sitting there with my Bible open, and I think I had a light, uh, you know, like a flashlight with me. And I was just looking in the, over the Psalms and reading them. 
And the Spirit of God led me to just kind of chant the Psalms. And as I was sitting there, I started to chant the Psalms. No, I'm not going to do that because I don't know if it was in rhyme, rhythm, or anything like that. But it, it allowed me to enter a realm of um, a realm of power. The Psalms are powerful scriptures, by the way. And if you don't realize it, the Psalms are used by witchcraft workers. The Psalms are used because the Psalms are spiritual words. And uh, they are used extensively by workers of witchcraft and sorcery to, ha to gain illegal access into the realm of the spirit. Uh, the 23rd Psalm is a Psalm um, that many use you know, to begin to tap into familiar spirits and to tap into um, the spirit world um, generally. And the 91st Psalm also. But when we use the, the, the Psalms, we are legally, that is, we are, we, are, we are connecting with the Holy Spirit. And in connecting with the Holy Spirit, we are then legally entering, entering into another realm of power, another realm of authority. The Psalms, again, are their powerful keys into the supernatural realm. And uh, when we engage that particular key, it opens up so many opportunities for us to, to, to shut down the work of the enemy in our family, in our finances, in our health, in, our, in, in the dimension of life that we touch. That is the, the natural touch-feel world in which we live. Because you realize this morning, my friends, that you may live in a touch-feel world touch feel world that is you have five senses where you taste you touch you you know you hear and all of these things that are naturally things that we engage every day but there's more to life than that your life now there is a life that is bios or biological life the greek word from what that comes is bios b-i-o-s but there is more than just bios or biological life. There is another kind of life which is zoe life or spirit life or God's life. That is your spirit man renewed by the Lord you know, through salvation as another level of life. That's why Jesus said, I've come to give you life. You already had bios life. So why does he say then he's come to give you life? There is something that is supernaturally greater than the biological life that you, that you have. I don't know if you hear it, but um, rain is pouring on the outside, my God. <laughs> but um, there is a supernatural, there is a biological life that you have, but on top of that is supernatural power. And, and this morning, as you and I engage the scriptures, as you and I engage the word of God in the Psalms, we are entering in. It is as if we, have, we are going to open a door and we are going to step into an atmosphere of supernatural power. Amen. Uh, we are going to step into an atmosphere of supernatural blessing. Amen. My God, and I, I, I think each morning that I've done these teachings, as soon as I start the teaching, the rain begins to fall. And each time I've said that, I, I, I think the Lord is attesting to the fact He's raining, R-E-I-G-N-I-N-G, -R -E raining, that's ruling, and He's raining, R-A-I-N-N-G, His glory on whatever it is that we are talking about, amen? But but you are, you, you have... You have stepped in. We, we have a tendency um, to step in and out of God. We have a, a tendency to, stop, to step in and out of Christ. But, but his ultimate aim is for us to live in him, uh, for our breath to be taken in him, for our life to be in him 24-7. We, unfortunately, again, we have a tendency of stepping in and out of him. We have a tendency of thinking, you know, carnally and then thinking spiritually. But it is not his intention to renew our spirit man and then have our spirit man be controlled by our flesh. <coughs> Excuse me. 
All of us have that issue, unfortunately. <laughs> what we can work toward, and we are doing that right here in Morning Prayer Life, we are working toward um, creating a greater sense of the authority and the realm of power that God has allowed us to enter as children of the King. A renewed man, a renewed boy or girl or adult, a renewed human being, renewed in the sense of recreated in righteousness and in the image of God, um, does not have to live the way everyone else lives. There is an ability that's available to you. There is a, a, a sense of, and we sometimes, uh, unfortunately, in a cavalier way, use the word power. But the word power, the word power, the, you know, several meanings or several derivations um, from the Greek. Number one, the word power uh, in the King James can be also um, interpreted um, authority. That is, we have the right to do something. We have the privilege to do something. We have the God-given right. We have, you know, in our own home, nobody has to tell you when you can open your refrigerator and take something out. Nobody can tell you when to go to bed as an adult and when to wake up in the morning. You know, you may have certain limitations because of job and so on. But you realize that you are pretty much in control of your life. Well, God has given us a level of authority. The exousia, the, the Greek word is exousia, the, the, the God-given right and privilege to act on his behalf in the earth, to act on his behalf in the world. But then he has given us something else. You know, he's given us not just the right or the authority, but he's given us the ability. My God. Woo! He has given us the source of power, the, the ability, his own might, that gives us the opportunity to, to exercise authority, but exercise authority with power. Uh, you know, uh, a civilian standing in the street, raising his hand and stopping cars, they may or may not stop. A police officer with a weapon on his um, waist and uh, the uniform you know, of the particular department that he's in that is recognized in the jurisdiction that he is, that police officer uh, commands respect because there is power behind him. There is the power of the state behind him, the power of the country behind him, the power of the city behind him. So when he speaks, when he raises his hand, everybody realizes that there is more to him than meets the eye. Well, so too, uh, the world, the circumstances, the issues, sickness and disease, no matter what it is that is inconsistent with the will of God for you, recognizes your authority, that is the right that you have to exercise the will and purpose of God as you know it from the word of God. And it also then recognizes that not only do you have the right, but you have the ability. Amen? That's why you have supernatural life. You have supernatural life. I said the right is from the Greek word exousia. E-X-O-U-S-I-A. Um, the Greek word exousia. Let me just say it again. But the ability comes from the Greek word dunamis. Um, or it's the same word that we have or we have derived the word dynamite. It is an authority that will upset the apple cart. It's a power that will change foundations. It's a power that will change atmospheres. It breaks down things and recreates them in ways. Think about, think about when somebody dynamites a building uh, uh, and the building implodes. Uh -uh. Think about when somebody dynamites a mountainside and the mountainside collapses. You think about how the landscape changes when dynamite is used. Well, think about the power of God that in you, the dunamis power, um, exercised by the right that you have to use it and how it can change uh, the paradigm of your life, how it can change the atmosphere of your family, how it can absolutely revolutionize your life. You become a radical believer you become a believer that lives and moves in Christ in a way that you allow nothing, absolutely nothing, to change you. To and by the way, when I say that, I don't mean you don't have, you know, questions. I don't mean you don't have certain challenges. I never mean that you're going to be perfect. You strive to be that, 
but, but you are a human being and you will have a few challenges. But the, the challenges begin to pale in comparison to the authority and to the ability that you have to deal with them. As a child, there are things that you could not handle. You never paid as a bill, a bill for example, you know, in New York City, um, you know, um, we had Con Edison. And uh, as a boy in Brooklyn, New York, I never paid a Con Edison bill. My mom paid the bill on, on our behalf. You know, in Jamaica, we have JPS. I now pay JPS bills because I am responsible. So God has given me in my maturity, in my majority, he has given me the ability to exercise now my authority. And he brings in the resources to allow me to handle those things. He gives me the authority and he gives me the ability. My God, be a radical believer. Begin to walk with God uh, in this supernatural way. Begin to ask him to open your eyes to see the power uh, and again remember now I'm saying that we use that word in such a cavalier manner we sometimes don't understand the depth of that word um, and power means in this in this case it means the dunamis that is the earth changing foundation altering atmosphere affecting life changing transformational power of God released in the earth by his ambassadors, you. By his ambassadors, by his missionaries, you. You are the ones that God has fully empowered. So when we use the word empowered, he has given you his dunamis. He has given you his ability. He, and, and it's not, you know, you must realize, it's not because you have a hammer, you have a gun, you have a physical weapon. Because the scripture says it's not, you know, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not physical weapons. But they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And they will do what? They cast down imaginations and everything that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God. So, it is not enough physical appearance. It is not enough physical weapon. But it is in the power of the Spirit. Amen? Let me, my God, I've gone a half an hour already. My God, I, uh, time flies. I don't know how and why. But let's go to Psalm 91. It says in the first verse of the 91st Psalm, He, and I want to emphasize this, He here is um, not gender specific. It is not saying that it's just a man. This is gender neutral in the fact that, hey, it's meaning you, woman, man, boy, girl, no matter who you are, he, um, identifying that, that pronoun, identifying you and I as candidates for what is about to be said. He who dwells in the shelter, I'm in the amplified version of the 91st Psalm. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High um, will remain secure and rest in the shadow of the Almighty whose power no enemy can withstand. Whoa! Did you read that? Amplified version now. I, you know, you got to look at it sometimes. Don't just study King James. Get into the Amplified. Get into the message. Get into uh, Murdoch's. Get into, um, you know, Wycliffe. And get into some of the other versions and, and, and study them and read scriptures by comparing them in the various versions. Let me read verse 1 again. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will remain secure and at rest will remain will remain secure and at rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Now in brackets there is an amplification. The Amplified Bible is an amplification of the meaning of the words that the author of this book used. So it amplifies the cultural context of the word and amplifies the cultural meanings and the nuances of the meanings of the word so that you and I understand what the person was saying in from a pictorial representation we are understanding in the language of our day what that individual was attempting to communicate and so let me read that verse again he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will remain secure and rest in the shadow of the Almighty 
whose power no enemy can withstand. My God. Whose power you are going to, and I shouldn't put it that way, if you are not a child of God, you are going to, but if you are a child of God, you are already there, you have the distinct privilege of what remaining secure and remaining at rest uh, in the power, in the, in the shadow of God, in the protecting power of God, in whom, in whom or who has power that no enemy can withstand. Verse 2 says, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. He's the place um, that I run to. He is the one that I seek after. He's the one when the challenges come and when the issues are uh, so formidable they may be, when they face me, He is the one. He's my refuge. Um, he is my fortress. So when I run to Him, then He provides me with that protecting hedge. Then the scripture says, come on now, you realize it, you, I mean, you've thought about it. The scripture says that he sets his angel uh, around you. Um, he, he encamps the angels of heaven around you to keep you. Uh, he does things to ensure that uh, the enemy's weapons cannot uh, harm you. He said, no weapon formed against you shall prosper because you are in his fortress. And you must realize the fortress is not a physical fortress, but it's a fortress, impenetrable fortress created by the atmosphere you have developed through faith and through the knowledge of the Word of God. You see, you have come to a place where you understand who you are, where you understand that you have life beyond the bios or the natural life. You come to a place where you understand that the supernatural power of God is at work in you. My God, how great it is for you to understand and know this. Amen? How great it is. But you see, your enemy and mine, he doesn't want us to know this. He, all he wants us to know is that we ought to, do, you know, let, let's, as Christians, let's not wear earrings. Or as Christians, let us not braid our hair, talking about the woman. As Christians, let us, you know, dress a certain way or do a certain thing and you know, so we have all these liturgical and religious manifestations that uh, denominations teach. But we have not engaged the power, the inherent ability of God that's on the inside. Now, I'm not saying that you don't dress modestly. I'm not saying that they're not things that we as Christians may choose to not do. But a lot of times, none of those things have anything to do with who you are in Christ. Uh, have nothing to do with the power of God that's in manifestation. But it has everything to do with a carnal side that wants to try to develop. You see, what we are trying to do with how we dress, with how maybe we speak, with all the liturgy and the words and the things that we have developed, we are attempting to reach God. But God has already reached us. Amen? We don't have to prove anything to God. We don't have to dress with the longest skirt um, um, sweeping the ground to show God how much we, we love Him. You know, uh, He already knows it because you might have that long skirt on, but your heart might not be right with Him. Uh, but it is, it, it, it is a word in the 91st Psalm that says we come to Him, we dwell with Him. And when we dwell with Him, we dwell in a, in a sense and in a presence of his ability that is um, impenetrable. My God, I, I, can you fathom that? Can you fathom? Remember, I said the 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 word of God in the Psalms are capsules of tremendous supernatural anointing. The the words of God in the Psalms are capsules of tremendous supernatural power, tremendous supernatural ability. And as we are reading them, as we are speaking them, we realize that they are already changing and charging, electrifying the atmosphere around us, um, changing the way we think, changing the way others will view us, changing the circumstances, 
sort of magnetizing our life and drawing the good. In the 23rd Psalm, it says, goodness and mercy shall follow me. Well, why does goodness and mercy follow me? Because I am attractive to goodness and mercy. I attract goodness and mercy. I, I, I am a magnet to goodness and mercy. I, I, I am a vacuum to goodness and mercy. I draw the goodness and the mercy and the things of God because my life in God's realm um, is something that actually pulls all the good things into it. Amen. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, now listen to this next part of verse 2, in whom I trust. Now, again, an amplification of trust is with great, whom I trust with great confidence on, and on whom I rely. My God. <laughs> uh, whom I trust with great confidence and on whom I rely. I rely. I rely. You know, there's an old hymn, you know. Great is thy faithfulness. You know, there's another hymn that I remember singing as a boy, leaning on or relying on the everlasting arms. What an awesome thought. But it's not just a thought. It is the reality of the life, <coughs> excuse me, it is the reality of the life of a Christian. You attract the good things of God. You know, um, when you love, you attract love. When you hate, you attract hate. But as a child of God, you, you, you attract the good things of God. You attract the blessings of God. And the unfortunate thing, again, is that when we get to churches and we get to places, all we hear is how powerful the devil is and how, and how really, we don't say it that way, but this is what we mean, how awesome um, the devil is. And how uh, you know effective he is in doing what he does, and we sensationalize the satanic realm, but we do not really emphasize the power, the majesty, the righteousness, and the ability of God at work in you. That is the magnet for the goodness of God, for the mercy of God, for the provision of God. We talk about Jehovah Jireh, for example, how God is our provider. But do you realize that the provision of God is something that comes because you attract it? The provision of God is not something that drops on you. The provision of God comes because of a law of the kingdom of God that says, whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And that's in a, you know, in a variety of areas of our life. But let's talk about Jehovah Jireh, the, the provider, the, the provider, the provider of uh, uh, of, of resources, the provider of finances, the provider of health, the provider of peace. You think about that. How do we attract um, the gyra? How do we attract the provision? How do we do so as we walk with God, uh, as we believe God, as we speak the words of God, as we emphasize the presence of God around us, there is a natural, supernatural, <laughs> oh God, I don't know. There is a, a natural, supernatural, there's a supernatural attraction that just is with us. We are brethren, my friends. We are friends of God. And anything we do according to his will immediately attracts whatever it is that his will provides. The consequences, and maybe sometimes you may think consequence is maybe in a negative connotation, but it's not so. Consequence can be negative, but consequence can also be positive. <coughs> you know, sometimes we pray and we intercede and we have a good worship service. We have a good period of intercession. <coughs> and at the end of it, we begin to pray, God, protect us from the retaliation of the enemy. Um, in Jamaica, I've heard the term used, protect us from the backlash of the enemy. Well, let me ask you a question. Have you ever stopped to think that we are so focused on the enemy's backlash we are giving him greater power over us. What about focusing on the blessing that comes from interceding? The blessing that comes from praying? The blessing that comes from being in Bible study? The blessing that comes from worshiping? Uh, why don't we focus on those things? Amen? We, we seem to love to focus on the negative. But let me continue because I want to, 
I don't think I'm going to finish it this morning, but I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, verse 2, and my fortress, my God in Him, in whom I trust with great confidence and on whom I rely. Um, verse 3 says, For He will save you from the trap of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. As a little boy, what I would do, my brother and I in Jamaica, little kids in our backyard there in Kingston, Jamaica, what he and I would do, um, we would set little traps. We'd make cages with um, chicken wire and make a little box and it would put a little, um, you know, a little, uh, get a rope and put a little stick under the box and put some maybe breadcrumbs under there and, and place it where a bird might see it. And then we would go behind the bush and we would watch for when the bird goes in and when the bird grabs a hold in its beak of that thing, whoop, and we, we trap the bird. Well, the enemy does the same things to us. He sets traps for us. He sets ambushes for us. You know, I, I, I want you to hear the story of, of how they catch certain monkeys in Africa. Uh, I don't remember the particular type, but they would put um, bananas in a, in, in a container. And the container would be, um, there would be a hole in that container large enough for the monkey to put his hand into it. But when he grabs a banana, he cannot um, extricate his hand. He cannot pull his hand out of that. Uh, he cannot uh, escape it. On, he has to drop the banana. But the monkeys won't drop the banana. And because they won't drop the, the banana, they get caught. And you think about things that we won't give up. <laughs> Think about things that the enemy has put in our life and that they have trapped us and we will not release them. Um, we hold on to them and because we hold on to them, we are kept in bondage. We have to release the banana um, so that our hand would be free. And uh, so this morning, you know, I, I said, the word of God is so interesting and so powerful. He says, for he will save you from the trap of the fowler. Through wisdom. In this case, it's wisdom. It's understanding. It's revelation of the word of God that says there are some things you need to let go right now. Things that you are touching people, even people that you are holding on to, that you need to release. You need to let go because they are limiting you and limiting your potential. You, uh, uh, that's just about it, um, Brother Rodney. They were caught red-handed, uh, but, but they will not release uh, the, the thing that they are holding on to. My God. He will save you from the trap of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. My God. I, I want to point something out to you. If you're not involved in running around and having, you know, sexual relationships with everybody under the sun, guess what? Their STDs are not going to be things, you know, um, these acquired diseases are not going to be things that will affect you. But when you open yourself up, to doing things outside of the protecting power and ability of God, then there is opportunity for things to come into your life. He protects you from the deadly pestilence. And when you're at a place, for example, like the Apostle Paul, where you know, a snake bit him, um, he didn't die. They were sitting there wondering, my God, what? Um, he's going to be dead now. And, uh, and he didn't die. And so they realized there was a greater power that was working in the Apostle Paul, like there's a greater power working in you. It says, you shall drink deadly things and they shall not harm you. I'm not telling you to go drink deadly things to test God or prove this word. I'm telling you, if it happens inadvertently, guess what? There is nothing that's going to happen to you. Somebody um, fed me some things some time ago, and uh, they actually said it out of their own mouth. And they realized that it didn't work. And while I was in Kingston, they said, they don't know what happened because they sent it to me. I don't know if it was something that just came out of their mouth with, without thought. Um, but they said it to me. My God. They said it um, that they were giving me something. And, and every week they would bring the thing and I would take it. Because to be frank with you, it was something that I liked. And they had put whatever they put in it. And they were saying, but it wasn't working. Well, guess what? I shall drink in any deadly thing and it will not harm me. Uh, they shall send their evil magic and their evil spells and sorcery against me, but it shall not work. They shall speak all manner of evil against me, 
But in this will I be confident that I live in him and I exist in him. Verse 4, uh, quickly. He will cover you and completely protect you with his pinions or feathers. And under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield on, and a wall. Now, I am not going to I'm not going to get into a lot more detail in some of these because that's for the sake of time. Or maybe next week I'll go through it a little bit more. Um, he will cover you and completely protect you with his feathers. One of my teachers, actually my mentor, um, Brother Kenneth E. Hagen Sr., uh, he said something to us in class one day that I have never forgotten. My God, he said that we must let things fall off our back like water on a, uh, that falls off of a duck's back. And I never thought about this. I never heard anybody talk about that. So I went back and I read it and I looked up. The, the, the feather of a duck or the feather of any bird like that that, that, that you see is on water, um, but specifically a duck now, um, it's coated with a, a very thin layer of oil. My God, oil representing the Holy Ghost. A very thin layer of oil. So when water um, goes onto the back of the duck, it doesn't penetrate the outer layer of feathers. Why? Because you know, if you lift up the, the, the feathers, there are softer feathers that are around, the, they are closer to the body of the duck, but there are these other feathers that have this oily coating on it. And the oil does not allow water to penetrate um, those out, that outer layer. So water doesn't soak the duck, my God. And so the oil of the Holy Ghost, oh my gracious Father, the oil of the Holy Ghost, um, saturates our life. The oil of the Ho Holy Ghost, it, it makes us, I like what Nikki just said, we are oily. <laughs> we are oily, yes God. Yes, Sister Nikki, we are oily. Uh, and so, the oil of the Holy Ghost so saturates us that, uh, that um, nothing really comes that can come close to us, my Jesus. It just falls off. So words that people speak, circumstances that come to change our minds or set us off track, and nothing like that penetrates. It can't come close. It can't affect us physically. <coughs> my God. It says, He will cover you and completely protect you. <coughs> His faithfulness, <coughs> excuse me, is a shield and a wall around you. Now, verse 5. Uh, you know, I'm, I can talk about that verse a little more, but let me go to verse 5 quickly. You will not, you will not, not be afraid of the terror by night, and nor of the arrow that flies by day, or the arrow, nor of the destruction, or uh, the pestilence that stop. Let me, let me start again. You will not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day. We, we don't have arrows, but we have weapons, we have guns, we have ammunition, we have knives, nor of the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor of the destruction, the sudden death. Destruction, I'm talking about accident and sudden death that lays waste at noon. That is right in the open. There are things, opportunities, um, ambushes that the enemy is setting up for us, but he says in verse um, 5 and verse 6 that none of it None of it can affect us when we walk in the presence of the Most High. When we dwell, when we live, when we wake, when we walk through the day, when we go to bed at night in the presence, when we dwell in the presence of God. And uh, uh, I, I, I'm caught between two because we only have eight minutes left. But a thousand, it says in verse 7, may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but danger will not come near you. People will be flooded around you, but your home will not be flooded. You know, people will have all kinds of diseases going on around you. You know, all the pestilence going on around you. 10,000 uh, may fall at your side, you know, and uh, uh, well, 1,000 at your side and, and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. You will only be a spectator, verse 8 says, 
as you look on with your eyes and witness the divine repayment of the wicked as you watch safely from the shelter of the Most High God. So you're going to see it, but you don't have to experience it. You're going to be aware of it, but you don't have to live in it. You live in the presence of God. Because you have made, you have made the Most High your refuge, your dwelling place. No evil, the scripture says, will befall you, nor will any plague, plague, uh, breast cancer, uh, nor will any plague uh, high blood pressure, nor will any plague, you think about the various plagues that have come to the earth, nor will any plague, that's a very, it's a hefty word, come near your, your dwelling. For he will command his angels in regard to you to protect and to defend and to guard. Listen to these three words, to protect, to defend, and to guard. Did, did you, you realize the words that I, I chose today, the hashtags? Defended and protected. It comes from this verse. Defended and protected. And I should probably use the last one, guarded. Defended and protected. There's somebody watching over you. There's somebody watching 24-7 um, over your life. There's somebody taking great care. Uh, and that is God. That is the angelic realm. That the forces of heaven are encamped around about you this morning. And uh, there is nothing, no weapon that is formed. For he will command his angels in regard to you to protect, to defend, and guard you in your ways of... Now, you've got to l listen to the rest of this. I, I don't know. Um, as a matter of fact, let me see if I can put it up. Uh, let's see if I can put it up really quickly. I want you to see this just in case you don't have the amplified version of the Bible. My Lord, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord. Glory to God. Kotora Baba Seta. Well, it is not coming up on my screen. So let me just go ahead and read it for sake of time. For he will command his angels in regard to you to protect and defend and guard you in all your ways. Now listen to this part. Of obedience and service. So it's not just any old person that he's going to protect and guard. It's not any disobedient, rebellious individual that he's going to protect and guard. In my home, when people become rebellious and disobedient, they have to leave. I will not put up. It says where strife is, there is every, where there is rebellion and strife. If it's in my home, if there's rebellion and strife, it says there is every evil work of the enemy. And so I have to make decisions to extricate the cancer of strife and the cancer of rebellion from my surroundings if people are unwilling to be obedient and unwilling to get rid of whatever it is that's going wrong. And in my circle of friends, when there is strife, when people, there are people that, are, that have been around me in my life that it seems that their life is just full of confrontation and strife. They can never rest until they're creating problems or causing people to come against each other. And uh, up to recently, I had to actually sever a relationship because I recognized that it was nothing but strife and strife and strife and strife. And I will not allow myself to be involved in strife all the days of my life. Every evil work of the enemy is there. It says we will lift up our hands. It says they will lift up their hands so that we will not even strike our foot against the stone. It says we will tread upon the lion, that is the demonic world, and the cobra, my God, so that not even we will tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Remember Genesis where the Lord said, where, where God the Father said to Satan that there's somebody that's going to come that will stomp his head. Well, right here you see it. We will tread upon the demonic world. We will tread upon principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world. And we will be conquerors. 
we will be victorious because we are guaranteed we are guaranteed victory when we are willing and obedient servants because we have set our love verse 14 says because we have set our love on him therefore God will save us he will set us securely the Bible says on high because we know his name he and we confidently trust and rely on his name knowing he will never abandon us and it says no never will he abandon us he will call upon me the Lord says and I will answer him I will be with him in trouble I will rescue him and I will honor him and I want you to look at the very last verse um, for that this morning in the minute we have left with long life with a long life I will satisfy him and I will let him see my salvation my God what a song what a powerful psalm this morning um, we will see his salvation we will know his salvation we will understand his salvation we will experience his saving grace amen God bless you you're heading into the weekend remember Ava Grace um, Ava Strong hashtag Ava Strong remember lifting up Ava and remember lifting up her family amen and as you lift up each other I mean I see you all talking among yourselves and I see things going on I am really so blessed to have you as friends and have you as part of morning prayer line and uh, pray for us as we enter the weekend ourselves for our services and the things we do um, I had a conversation with someone yesterday absolutely wonderful wonderful um, time on the phone with one of one of you and I really appreciate the encouragement and the words that you send you know to keep us on track I feel I know that I feel I know it is a where I am and what I do this is a pioneering effort uh, people don't understand people don't know people sometimes really don't have a clue what God has for them and the promises and the covenants and we are they're so involved in in religion and I feel like I'm tilling soil. I feel like I'm taking rocks out of the soil. And the enemy comes against us in such a dramatic way. Um, and one of the things we said yesterday online was, um, there you don't find people throwing stones at um, fruitless trees. In Jamaica, you'll see the boys coming home from school and they're throwing a stone at a mango tree. Well, if they were just leaves there, they're not stoning leaves they see some a nice mango ripe mango on the tree and they're getting ready they want that mango to fall so they, they can enjoy it well it's because they see fruit on the tree why they throw the stones well you see my friends um, the enemy throws stones at fruitful trees and uh, you know I have had my share of stones and that's why I ask you to pray and I'm sure you've had your share of stones and so we pray for each other. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Worship God. If you're in the Port Maria area, come visit us at 27 Stennett Street, Axe Church. And, uh, and enjoy um, a day in the presence of God with us. God bless you. And as we leave, I am going to uh, play our song, our Ava song. And uh, giving us a chance to hear that one more time. Um, again. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Well, let's go right here. Ava Strong. Again, you all have a wonderful, wonderful day. God bless. Jesus.
Wonderful day, everyone. We'll see you next time. Amen. God bless.